So thank you so much for the invitation. It's uh, great to be here. As you already said, I will be speaking in English since my Swedish, Danish, Norwegian mix is not that good, I think, if you really want to explain something. Um, but yes, please, everybody feel welcome to speak Swedish to each other and, and to me, but I will respond in English. So I'm a postdoc at the University of uh, Gothenburg at the economics department. That means I, ha I have my PhD from Denmark in experimental and behavioral economics and have been working with behavioral economics for over five years now. And part of that, as we will see now during the presentation, is that nudging is in a way an application of this research that we do at the university in behavioral economics. So it's kind of the applied part um, of what we do research on. Um, and for since the past year, pretty much, I've been giving more of these talks and workshops on nudging and how to use that for, for municipalities, for companies, for organizations here in Sweden, but of course also uh, in other places. So I've been working with, in Denmark as well with some organizations. So what I prepared for today is a little bit of an introduction into what is behavioral economics, what is nudging, there's going to be some examples, but then since Ida is going to talk later, she's going to have a bit more the, the direct Swedish examples of what they have been doing. So this is going to be a little bit more of a, of a general introduction. What is nudging? How do we understand that? How do we work with it uh, in general? So the guy here in green, this is John. And John is a, he's a very important person. He's a big manager at a company. So, well, kind of rising manager, still relatively young, but he has a lot of things to do. So he runs from meeting to meeting, and he's very important. He already makes a lot of money, gets promoted. Um, and John is a, he's a really smart guy, so he's, a, he's quite important for that company. And the other guy, that's uh, John's employer. And John's employer really wants John to uh, save for retirement. So he wants it so much that he says, well, we're going to add some money from the company. So for every dollar that you put into your retirement fund, we're going to put some money on top. And then the government will even put some more money on top. So that's a great deal, right? So he has a, John has a good salary. So the employer really wants him to have this pension scheme uh, for the future uh, and save for retirement. But the odd thing is that John does not sign up for that pension scheme through the company. He just doesn't really fill out those formulas. Um, so he works, he earns money, and time goes on, and he never enrolls into that really nice pension scheme where he could be getting so much extra money for his retirement. So why is this the case? Well, if we think about it from like also traditional economic perspective, maybe John doesn't know that he should be saving for retirement. Or he doesn't know about this pension plan. So maybe he's like so busy with all his work that actually if we, somebody would actually tell him that he could get this extra money and tell him how much he's going to have later in retirement if he enrolls now that he's so young and so productive, maybe then he would actually enroll into the retirement plan. So what does the company do? They say, OK, let's spend some money. Let's do a great financial literacy class. So all our managers have to go to this class in the afternoon, and they're told how great this pension scheme is. And uh, that is, uh, yeah, that they should enroll. So John goes to the class. He already knew this, right? He's a very smart manager. So he knew that if you save early for retirement, you're going to get some money later. He was also informed when he joined the company that they had these extra benefits. But yeah. Well, next meeting is coming up, and again, he doesn't enroll into a retirement plan. So still, days go by, and he's not enrolled, and he's missing out on the, on the extra money. So they ask some economists, they say, well, why doesn't John want to be enrolled in this re retirement plan? And they say, well, maybe the money just isn't good enough. Maybe what the company is matching or what the government is adding to the money he's saving, maybe that's not enough. Maybe like for, for those... Uh, one dollar or something extra, or even if it's a direct match, maybe that's, that's not enough for him to really care because he doesn't think it's going to make that big of a difference. So let's try to double that money. Let's say that uh, the employer should just give him twice as much money to enroll. So companies have done that, and they say you get, for every one dollar you put in, we're going to put two dollars into your retirement fund. And I mean, that, that's a lot of money. But John is still busy, so John still doesn't 
save any money for retirement because he still doesn't enroll into the retirement plan. So that's bad, right? So maybe if we're going to give him $100 for every dollar, maybe then it's going to work. But which company has the money to, to do that for their employees? So that doesn't seem to be a viable thing. So we can think, continue thinking about it. And then maybe at some point we come to the conclusion, maybe John does just not want to save a retirement. Maybe he really just wants to spend all his money today. He wants to go out and go on vacation and drink cocktails. And he really does not want a retirement plan because Otherwise, why wouldn't he be signing up if we're giving him money, if we're educating him? He knows it's important and he's still not doing it. So then, I mean, our last resort is he really just doesn't want to. But then, so this was the kind of the state that they were in in the UK, thinking about, okay, apparently 40% of the people employed in the UK do not want to roll up, enroll to these um, retirement plans. So maybe we should leave them alone. But then, the behavioral insights team said, okay, let's try one more thing. Let's just enroll John into the retirement plan. And then if he really doesn't want it, we'll send him a mail and say, if you don't want to have it, you can opt out. So now that all the employers said, okay, everybody is employed with us and who's not enrolled yet, we're just going to automatically enroll them into the retirement plan and then be done with that. So Obviously now, if John really didn't want to, and they're suddenly taking away his money and putting it in a retirement plan, and he was trying to go to the Bahamas for that money, he would complain and try to get it back, right? So then he would send a mail and say, no, I did not want to be in this retirement plan, please give me my money back. But what happens is that John is really happy actually, because finally somebody enrolled him, and he knew this was a good idea, and he knew he was gonna get money for, for later, but somehow he just never really got around to uh, to enrolling into the plan. So what happened in the UK was about that uh, 400,000 uh, new people were enrolled into these uh, plans and about one in 10 or something decided to opt out but then often for other reasons and then they asked them why did you opt out again? I said because I have some private retirement savings I want to have, I want to buy a house, this, these kind of things. So, um, but those nine out of 10 other people who weren't enrolled before they were happy because somebody finally changed this uh, default, as we're calling this nudge, that actually made it so much easier to, to be enrolled. And they didn't want to opt out anymore. And in the UK, this led from a 63% to an um, 80% um, coverage of people who were enrolled, uh, enrolled into these matching uh, grants. So then from a behavioral economics perspective, we're thinking about, okay, so why did this work? So the money didn't work and the education didn't work. So why did just enrolling them? Um, so it's just, it was just a little thing, right? He just had to download these piece of papers, read through them, check which one he wanted and sign it and send it off. If you compare that to the money that he could have received in all those years or months where he wasn't signed up, this was a tiny cost. I mean, these were maybe half an hour of, of work, maybe one hour, but even if he were an amazing manager, he's probably not going to earn more than, I don't know, 10,000 kroners an hour, and he would probably have saved more for his retirement had he signed up immediately and not procrastinated. So push this into the future for that long. So sometimes it doesn't really add up, right? The cost of, of an action compared to the cost of the benefit that you get out of it, it doesn't really seem to be the same. So something that I also work with is a bit, so why do people see this so differently? And then we say, well, so we all know what discounting is, right? If you put money on the bank, it grows. And uh, um, if you get it back later, you get some extra money for, for leaving it there for a while. But then there's also something that we call hyperbolic discounting. So that means the present moment means so much to me that anything that's a little bit after the present moment gets discounted by so much that this suddenly becomes, that this tiny half an hour of looking at these uh, forms becomes so much bigger than all the money he's going to receive in 40 years. Because he so strongly uh, discounts his time and then this effort of having to sit down and look at this form um, is always seems to be bigger because the difference between today and tomorrow, that's not going to be a huge different in his retirement savings, right? So whether he does it today on the first day of the job or the second day of the job, that's not going to matter that much. But the next day, again, he thinks it's easier to do it tomorrow, and that's how we move on, and that's how years go by without him enrolling, because it always seems cheaper to do it tomorrow and not do it today. 
So by enrolling him into this automatically, um, we get rid of these costs. So when we look at this from a traditional economic perspective, this really shouldn't matter because then he should just compare the time cost of filling out this form to the money he's going to save later on. But it does matter a lot. So it mattered for 400,000 UK citizens, all of them relatively well educated at good companies. They started doing this at the, at the biggest major companies. So these are people, it's not that we're sometimes we're working with development countries or something where you could say developing countries, yeah, they might actually not know how to, that is important to save. They might not know what, what interest is. But for these people, they did know this. So this was not, it was not an education issue. So what's interesting about this is that a lot of the behavior we observe is systematic. So it's not that this is completely su surprising if you obviously have thought about it a bit and if we have uh, models, so that's what we do research on. So when we have a systematic behavior, we can uh, predict it and then we can use, try to um, try to change it or try to adapt it. But for that, we really need to understand what the actual problem is. Because the problem wasn't that there wasn't enough money or that he wasn't educated enough or that there were a lot of other things that might have come up. But the problem was really this cost between today and tomorrow that always seemed too large to actually fill out the form. So obviously we could try to have asked John in the beginning, like, so why aren't you filling out this form? And maybe he would have correctly answered, yeah, I'm always very busy and that's why I didn't do it. But with some other things, it can actually be a little bit tricky to get people to answer the way that they truly feel. Because if you ask the typical Nordic citizen, how much do you care about the environment? Pretty much everybody will say, oh, I care about it a lot. It's very important to me. I try to make choices that uh, are good for the environment. But then if you think about how many people actually buy organic products, environmental products, this doesn't match up at all. So it's maybe one in 10 who at least say that they um, sometimes buy environmentally products, but then it seems to be more like one out of 20 who actually does this if we have a market share of about 5% um, of um, yeah, organic or ecological products. So it seems that what people say and then what they actually do doesn't really seem to fit. So that is another clue that we're getting here. We're thinking about, okay, so maybe, maybe we cannot find this out by asking surveys or asking people what they want, because maybe there is more going on than what people perceive themselves seems to be the problem, um, stopping them from doing what they actually, what they say that they prefer, right? So they, as, as of, like John who wanted to save for a time and didn't want to go on vacation and have cocktails. I mean, there are a lot of people who say at least that they do care about the environment. So there seems to be something that is um, keeping them from, from doing this. So in, in research, uh, we call them cognitive biases. So this is a term that comes from, from psychology. Um, this is the, I cannot correctly say this, I think, <laughs> the Swedish uh, um, translation to it. Um, and there's hundreds of these. So uh, today I'm going to present three of them that we can look at a little bit uh, more in more detail. But if you just Google cognitive biases, I think Wikipedia gives you 250 results or something on different cognitive biases that uh, could be affecting behavior. And obviously there's a lot of people working on a lot of different uh, issues of these and trying then to, uh, to understand how these affect decision making in good or bad ways. So these biases, they kind of are the ones that prevent us from doing what we actually think is optimal or what would be rationally optimal in a traditional economic sense. So if I just think about, okay, what are the costs and what are the benefits of doing an action um, and the costs are smaller than the benefits, then I should have people taking this action. But then there seems to be something going on that we often don't see people acting that way. Right? So you can save a lot of money uh, for your retirement, but you're not doing it. So it's unclear why is this happening. And that's where these cognitive biases come in. They wouldn't show up in the traditional economic model of just comparing uh, the costs and the benefits for an activity. So when we go about trying to 
trying to do nudging, what we want to come to later, it's very important that the first step is to understand why we actually see this type of behavior, so that we really take the time to understand what is it really in the way? What is happening to John? What is he doing? Why isn't he, uh, isn't he signing up for this, for this plan? Because if we just read something about nudging, take that nudge and try to apply it to a different situation, I can almost promise you that that's not going to work and it might actually hurt um, the people you're trying to help. So, and also we're not really going to find the correct nudge if we don't know what we're trying to to nudge against or what we're trying to prevent. Um, so if we, if we don't see what this bias is, it's going to be very hard to find the correct nudge to actually go against this bias. So when I work um, in the nudging courses I give, we do a quite a long workshop, so that's an eight, eight hour a day and three hours of those workshops, and then we try to go step by step through this understanding and then nudging, or first defining the problem, then understanding and then nudging. And when I pe ask people afterwards, so what was the hardest part of this exercise? They were saying, actually, first trying to understand what's happening. So it usually is you have a problem and then you try to find a solution. And you're like, okay, this is our problem, let's send them a reminder or let's put a default. And so really, but we try to force them in the group work to say, okay, now for half an hour, you're only gonna talk about why do you think there's this problem without trying to find the solution. And that's usually the hardest part of the day, not trying to talk about which nudges you wanna do, but actually only to talk about why do we observe this behavior. So later in exercise is also something that we're gonna try in a shorter version actually to see how long can we spend on trying to understand this first before we try to come up with any, uh, yeah, with any remedies for this. So some, some research, so this is a lot of the research that has been done in psychology actually, this also understanding the biases, so that is, you know, comes not so much from economic studies but more from, uh, from psychology studies and it comes from observing individuals in different situations and then seeing how do these situations differ and how do people react differently to these situations. So I'm sure many of you this morning may be coming here, you've passed by, let's say, Espresso House, and then you see that they have these different uh, sizes of, uh, of cups, right? So I mean, some of them have, have more, but usually it's about these, uh, these three sizes. So if you would say that the typical Swedish person, or you, which one of these would you choose? Which size? The middle one, right? So logum is best. Uh, so especially here in Sweden, people will choose the middle one, right? And then if you ask people, so why, why the middle one? Do you have a good feeling? Why, why would you choose the middle one? Exactly. The middle one has the right amount of coffee, right? So that's, uh, that has the right amount of coffee. Okay, so you pass by espresso house and then you come to Starbucks and then they have these three sizes. Which one do you think people choose? They again choose the middle one, right? But that's funny because then apparently the now, smallest one and the middle one both have the right amount of coffee inside them, right? That's how much you want coffee you want. But how much coffee you want depends on how big the other two cups are. So obviously, maybe for coffee, it's not such a big problem. And I mean, this is clearly, of course, an example from marketing. That's how they try to sell you expensive wine. If you go to a restaurant, there's always going to be one wine on the menu that is far more expensive than what you would want to pay for wine. But that's going to make you say, well, then the second most expensive one isn't so ridiculous to order. So I'll take that one. But what we learn from this example is that individuals are very strongly affected by reference points, we could be called anchoring, so it depends on how, much a how a situation is framed and depending on what I put in both sides, what the other two options are, or the other 15 or the other uh, 35 options are, that's going to really affect um, what decision I make. And it doesn't seem to really reveal my true preferences for coffee, because then I should always choose the same size, no matter how many different coffees there are, because I know that I like 250 milliliters of coffee and not more and not less. But apparently, I don't know that because as soon as I'm presented with a different combination, suddenly I don't know anymore what I want. 
So I mean, sure, this is for coffee, but we can also apply this to other situations, to pension plans or something. There are suddenly different options or to job offers, right? Suddenly I see that there's some other, maybe, yeah, some, some other job which has other nice characteristics, and then I look at that one first as a very short commute time, and then a different job which might pay better and have other um, things that are good. But if I first see the one who has very short commute time, I might be very stuck to that oh, a short commute time, and then I might compare every other job to that on that characteristic, although that's maybe not the most important thing for me. But if I had first shown you something with a very high salary and then jobs with lower salaries afterwards, then I might have been strongly anchored to that. So, it can, so we can apply the situation to a lot of other things where people have to make decisions, and no matter what you give them first, I mean, there's some examples where they ask you about your person noma, and they say the two last digits. I mean, these are quite random, right? So, and depending on how high or low these are, you're going to make different choices afterwards. Although it's, and then I ask you, how long do you think the Amazon River is? Depending on your last two digits in person noma, you're going to give me a different answer. Which obviously is clear to everybody that that is not in any way related. Or they were asking people, how much do you want to pay for a keyboard? And then that also depended on what their person noma digits were. And I mean, this is, should really not matter, but it matters a lot. So another study, quite uh, a little bit similar in design, also one of these uh, old psychology studies has been shown quite a lot, is that they were trying to sell, sell jam in a, uh, in a supermarket. And then they had six different uh, flavors on display, and people could go and taste the different flavors. Um, people like that, right? They go, um, they try different ones. Do you like strawberry better than apricot? Um, and you compare those. But then they thought, right? You're your perfect preference, such as like the perfect amount of coffee that you want to drink, maybe your perfect uh, uh, jam would actually be fig with ginger, right? And that's unlikely to be among the basic six because that's a kind of a special thing. So maybe fig and ginger, maybe that's going to be exactly your preference. So that's the one you would really want. So then they displayed these 24 types of uh, jam. Um, and people like that, right? They come up, they taste a lot of jams. But obviously, the interesting part is now, do people actually buy a jam if they, um, if they have these many? Do you, think it makes a, do you think it makes a difference? Yes. You think yes, do you think no? OK. Where do you think more people buy a jam when they chat? You think with the six ones? Not the perfect one? You don't want your perfect jam? No? <laughs> yes. So when there's six uh, kinds, then you have 30% of people buying them. And we have 24 kinds, you have 3% of people buying them, right? So although the, your perfect jam was probably under those 24, people were more likely to buy one when there were just six. So this is what we call choice overload. So there's too many choices, and it makes people uncomfortable, because maybe I actually don't like fig ginger best, but uh, I don't know, uh, fig rosemary, and then I made the wrong choice. But it's easier to decide whether I like strawberry or apricot because those are they're further apart and it's a little bit easier to, to decide. So actually, I mean, again, this is a study from marketing. It's about to sell, sell jam. But again, we can try to translate it to a different system. I'm not very familiar with it, but as I understand here in Sweden, you had this change where there were suddenly 400 different pension schemes and people could pick their preferred one. And probably the perfect pension scheme for each person was under those 400 different pension schemes, so people could have picked the right one. But this made people quite unhappy because now they would need to go through 400 pension schemes to find the one that fit them best. And as we see, John couldn't even enroll into that uh, just one. Um, so obviously people were not happy to, to try to look at 400 different ones and to find the perfect one. So um, sure, here it's a little bit different because you just get into enrolled into default. Uh, but the idea is similar, that if you give people too many choices, it just makes them unhappy, and then they don't want to choose. Although again, the traditional economic model would say, yes, give people as much choice as possible, because that is most likely going to match their preferences. So second bias that we, we learn here is that individuals react negatively to too much choice. Um, and although we think it might, might help them to give them a lot of choices, it actually makes them um, less likely to choose. And now as a, 
out of the third example, again, another one of these uh, smaller studies. So here they wanted to see how people, um, how people react uh, when they're giving a leaflet and whether they're going to throw it on the ground. So this is more of an environmental study. So we have this uh, experimenter here, and she's handing out uh, these travel leaflets, so just pieces of paper on a student campus. And then they made three different conditions. In one condition, it was completely clean. So you walk onto the student campus, somebody hands you a leaflet, says something about the travel brochure, you take it and, and you move on. Um, then there was one setting where they had already put a lot of them on the ground, so the whole ground was littered with these leaflets. And then they had one condition where it was completely clean, but then they had one person who was a confederate, so somebody was on, in the experiment, and he was walking in front of each of these people and then throwing a uh, leaflet on the ground and then moving on. So now the question is, does that matter for your personal preference whether you're going to litter? Right? We should assume that people have some preferences for littering or not, right? Either I'm a person who throws trash on the ground or I'm a person who doesn't throw trash on the ground. It shouldn't matter whether other people uh, throw trash on the ground or this one other person did that. Right? So if I have true environmental beliefs, then I'm a person who doesn't throw trash on the ground. So do you think it matters? Yes. Yeah. So in the clean condition, about 6% of the people they observed uh, littered. So yeah, most people seem to not be throwing trash on the ground when there is none. But then when there was already trash on the ground, a third of people just threw their flyer to it. So the same person in, in both conditions, I mean, obviously these are randomly different people, but um, as if we observe enough, we could say they, they are the, simil uh, the same. So then the same person in a clean environment would throw nothing, versus in a dirty environment, um, every third person is going to throw their things on the ground. But the worst case is actually when they see one other person doing this. Right? So this having this one other person throw something on the clean ground made every second person in the experiment throw their flyer after that person. So seeing one role model or one other person behave either, obviously also in a good way, but also in a bad way, can so much affect what, what I'm going to do and how I'm going to behave. So here, obviously, this is an environmental study, but this is also true for a lot of other situations uh, where we observe other people behaving in a certain way. If we see other people eating more, if we see them eating healthier, if we see them exercising, in so many situations where we see what other people are doing and then try to infer something from this, like what is the correct thing to do in this situation, um, we see that people will do what other people do. So, and that's the um, third bias that I want to talk about today, and that means individuals are very strongly affected by social norms. So we see somebody else acting in a certain way, and we derive some information about this, what is correct to do in the situation, or what we should be doing. Or maybe if we want to throw trash on the ground, then do, seeing somebody else do it, say, well, I mean, it's not just me, so I'm going to feel less guilty for it because I might have wanted to do it anyway, but I kept it in because I thought it would be inappropriate and I feel bad for it. But as soon as uh, somebody else does it, I'm like, oh, well, then I can do it too. Um, so as I said, there's about 250 of these biases. I think that these three are especially interesting. I think in a lot of in designing forms and working with others. Um, so those are the ones I'm, I'm concentrating on today. But Obviously, if you're interested in this, there is a, there's a lot more to learn uh, on what kind of other biases there are. And again, I have to say that it's so important that we understand why this is happening, that maybe the flyer thing is not just a convenience thing, but it was actually, I mean, it was as convenient in all three conditions to throw it on the ground, right? It didn't make it easier or harder to do it. But in some conditions, I have these social norms, impacts, and that's why I behave differently. Well, maybe in the, in the default condition, it was actually easier to enroll, and that's what changed my behavior, and not so much that other people did it too. Yeah. So this is the, was then the first part, understanding why actually this be, we see this behavior we do. And then, of course, the next step is then to say, okay, so if we now understand that, yeah, people behave in certain ways and what drives them. So how can we then actually use this knowledge to help people do something better or do the right thing? Um, and then this is where nudging comes in. 
So this is then actually the part, so nudging is then the active part of using this knowledge in order to affect behavior. So let's start with a bit of a definition of what actually is nudging and how does it compare to other policy instruments. Because nudging, although it might sound often in media and in articles that it's quite uh, everything fits and it's everything and it's any type of communication or anything you do type of thing, it's actually not. It actually has quite a precise definition and um, it can also be compared to traditional policy instruments and there are, there are quite strong lines between what is nudging and what is, what is something else. So um, I think that is often also something that is quite surprising to people who want to learn more about nudging that it actually is not everything and uh, not anything you do in uh, try, trying to change behavior, but it has a very, um, it's a very uh, precise category. So when we look at the polic policy toolkit that, um, that we have, so now we can start looking at just really from the governmental perspective, is that one of the tools we have are, um, are bans and regulations. So that's, that's a whole uh, legislative. Um, so we make rules, right? If we don't want people to smoke, we say it's not allowed to smoke in buildings. It's not allowed to smoke in universities, not in here and there, and we have to be this far away from a building to do it. So there's quite strict rules. And if you don't adhere to these rules, you're gonna get fined, you're gonna go to prison, right? Depending on your, the offense that you do. Uh, but that's how we regulate behavior in most countries. So there's a lot of things for which there are very clear rules. We don't want people to kill each other, so there's a rule, you're not allowed to do that. If you do that, you go to prison, right? So that's quite strict. That is obviously also affects behavior because, yeah, that's what these rules are for, to shape, uh, shape decision-making uh, in a quite strict way. So that's the first category. Then the second category is anything that is a tax or a subsidy. So in either case, it would be if we want people to, do, if we want to discourage them from doing something, want to discourage them from smoking, we say, well, we're going to make cigarettes more expensive, and we put a tax on it. So that makes them more expensive, less people will want to buy them at that price, so less people will smoke. And this is also something that has been working. It worked in, in Europe, it works in the US, not to huge amounts, but at least uh, you can clearly see, this has been shown uh, many, many times, that adding a tax to cigarettes decreases uh, the amount of smoking. And on the other hand, obviously, if we subsidy, if you subsidize organic products, more people will want to buy these products because the price difference between traditional products and organic products decreases, so more people buy them. So that, again, changes behavior by changing something of their monetary incentive. I'm making it cheaper or I'm making it more expensive. Then we have the third category. And the third category is information. And information, I think here it's always the biggest problem when people try to understand what's nudging and what is not, that information itself is not nudging. So giving an information should make a difference to my behavior, right? So as we had in the beginning with John, telling him that if he saves for retirement, this is how much money he will have later on, this is information. So if he didn't have this before, then it should make a difference in his behavior. Because he already had this information, giving additional information didn't change his behavior because he already knew this, that this was a good idea, right? So if we, if we think about information campaigns, so the first time I, was, uh, I used the CO2 calculator to calculate the CO2 emissions of long distance flights, that was new information. I said, oh, that's uh, actually pretty bad considering how much I travel each year. That's uh, quite a huge amount of uh, CO2 emissions that come from, uh, from flying. Or if you think about meat and, uh, and vegetarian food, the difference is there. And the first time I get this information, this is not a nudge because it changes something about how I perceive a situation. So it changes something about how I see cost. So nudging should always be something that shouldn't make a difference based on these rational assumptions because it doesn't forbid it, it doesn't make it more or less expensive, and it also doesn't change anything about my preferences. It only changes my behavior. So whether I'm doing something or not doing something, but it doesn't change something how I see that behavior. It doesn't make me more environmental friendly or more pro, I don't know, immigrants or these kind of things. So it doesn't change anything in my mind. It just changes my behavior towards other people. Um, so that's how we add it as a fourth category to this tool set. And in that sense, there's a quite uh, clear difference between these policy instruments and nudging, but 
it is also something that belongs into this toolkit. So although a lot of things, and also the examples I showed previously with the behavior, come from marketing, and I was saying this before, if I say three out of four people bought the shampoo, and I see three out of four people enroll into this retirement plan, it's the same psychological mechanism, and I'm showing the social norms that other people do this, so it's a good thing to do, you should do it too. One time I'm trying to sell a shampoo, one time I'm trying to get people to save for retirement. But it's the same psychological mechanism, but as I define, or a lot of economists define nudging, is if you're trying to incre increase welfare and not trying to increase uh, profits of a company. But that's how it differs, but that's also how it's very similar. So that's how marketing and, uh, and nudging can be similar. They just have a very different outcome, and they're ap applied by different people. So we come back to the John example in the beginning. So obviously what the employer could have said, said or the state could have said, well, you're forbidden to spend, go on vacation anymore and forbidden to spend that money. So we're just going to force you to put money into the retirement fund uh, because you cannot spend it for something else. That I would have uh, the norm. Then the second one, the tax was, well, making it cheaper, um, adding the, the money that the government gives to the retirement. So that's the subsidy here. The information was a literacy class giving people information they didn't have previously. And then the nudging part comes in, it's just making it easier to enroll into the retirement plan because that was, was what was stopping John from, uh, from enrolling. But as you can see, it shouldn't change anything about monetary incentives. It doesn't change anything about his attitudes towards retirement savings and it's not forcing him to be there. So he could, with the same cost, also again opt out of this plan. Uh, so it's not making it more expensive. And that's also how uh, Taylor and Sunstein define a nudge. It says any aspect of the choice architecture that alters people's behaviors in a predictable way, right? We want to know what we're doing without forbidding any options or significantly changing their economic incentives. Um, so to be as nudged, the intervention must be easy and cheap to avoid. So if you don't want to be nudged and if you have strong preferences about something, about it going the other way, then you should be able to, to avoid the nudge. So then the next step, so now we understood everything, so now we want to design the nudge. So that means we're going to use this knowledge we have from behavioral economics to design uh, choice situations for people to make the better choice. And that's what we do with this nudging. So one thing that also I've quite recently started adding to my presentations is this idea of who can we actually nudge? Because if we think about nudging in general, like is it something, so if we write it have a tax or if we have a ban, then we're definitely affecting everybody, right? If I just forbid smoking in buildings, people aren't going to do that. And the five people who do it, they're going to get a fine. So then I'm really targeting everybody. And same with taxes. Uh, so if it make it more expensive, everybody has to pay this price. But also if I think about nudging, who can I try to move from one situation to the other? It's a little bit of a smaller group because it's those people that, um, in econ terms, we call them the marginal people. So the ones who are just indifferent between one and the other option. So I think it's easiest kind of to see when you look at this, uh, for example, meat and vegetarian food. So on the one hand, you have these people who love a good barbecue and who would say, the best thing in the world is like, I need, if I don't get meat every single day, I'm not going to become a bodybuilder and I love meat and I love barbecues and it's really part of my identity that I barbecue every Saturday and this is super important to me. So I do not want to eat vegetarian food and vegetarian food is for losers and hippies and I'm not going to eat that. And then on the other side, you have the vegans who say, no matter what you pay me or what you do to me, I will not eat a dead animal. That's not going to happen, right? So on both sides, you have people with very strong preferences about eating meat or not eating meat. And these are the people who are on the outside, right? As so we see, there were also the smallest share, but these people have very strong preferences. So no nudge in the world is gonna make these people change their behavior. So probably you would have to, I don't know, either forbid meat or put the vegans on a deserted island where there's only pigs running around in, in order to make them change their behavior. So what we're trying to look at then was nudging are these people in the middle, the ones who, if, I mean, the sandwiches this morning, there was cheese on them, that's vegetarian, you ate that. If it had had some sausage on it, you would have eaten that. I mean, it's standing there, I don't really care. It's like, um, yeah, whatever, I'll just eat that. If the lunch today is more vegetarian, you're gonna eat that. If it's not, you're gonna eat that. Other people will write in early or say, I, I'm a vegetarian, is the lunch gonna be vegetarian? So I want vegetarian food, right? So these are already the people who are a little bit more here. So those are the ones who care that they 
they are not indifferent between what they get for lunch. But especially, for example, in this food discussion, so I did one experiment now with a restaurant, and it seems that there's about 15%, 20% of people who are pretty indifferent between one or the other. So we did this experiment where we put vegetarian on top of the menu or we put the meat on top of the menu, which made it the easiest to choose, and we see that about 15% switch from one to the other, depending on which menu they're confronted with. So these are the people that we can try to nudge, because these are the people for whom it's a tiny, I mean, if meat is on top and they have to look down and find the vegetarian on the menu, that's already too, too much cost, like psychological cost to choose the vegetarian. But if the vegetarian is on top and the meat is on the third page, then that's too much of a hassle to find a different food or to ask for it. Let's say if you're in a restaurant and they have meat on the menu and, then just to, and they say, we do have vegetarian food, you can just ask. Maybe that tiny ask is already enough to make people not do it or they just are not going to think about it enough. And this is similar in all the other situations where we try, where we try to nudge. There are some situations maybe if we want to have people reduce energy, which is kind of a continuous thing, so it's not I either save energy or I don't. So there it could be that we affect more people by a little bit. But in many of these decisions where it's about choosing one or the other, choosing green electricity versus regular electricity, there we have to look at those people who are quite indifferent. If you're already earning minimum wage and really have to look at every cent, no nudge is going to make you choose a more expensive electricity because you cannot afford it. If you, I don't know, on the other side, okay, on the other side it's maybe easier to nudge over, but so you want to have those people who could afford it who are just too lazy to switch right now. Um, public transport, I'm now trying to, to work with Gothenburg City a bit on this. So and then we had the single mother in the workshop and saying, well, I'm a single mother. My work is like half an hour away from the preschool. I need to take a car because there's no way I can make it to work first delivering my child in the preschool and then getting to my work, which is somewhere outside of the city. You're not going to nudge that person to take the public transport, right? There's huge costs involved of switching the mode of transport. On the other hand, maybe you have a student moving to town quite close to the university getting that person to choose maybe between a bicycle and a public transport or, or walking, that might not be so hard because he's like, oh, I'm new here, I don't really know. Oh, if there's a nice like, bike pass, I might rather take that than taking the bus uh, if it's convenient to go. Right? So that's again one of these people who is on the margin between one or the other decision and those are the people I can try to nudge over to one of the other sides. So I think this is very important to keep in mind that nudging is not a tool to affect everybody and it's certainly not a tool to affect the people who are the most difficult to change because it's just about adding or subtracting a small cost or, or benefit on either side to push some people over. But we were saying this uh, before um, this talk started that if you think about it from a national perspective, if it's just 1% of Swedish population, that's still a lot of people, right? So that's if you make these things on a larger scale, what the Behavioral Insights team has done in the UK, it still leads to 400,000 people switching their retirement plans. I now forgot how large the public working population of the UK is, but I mean, those are more than 400,000 people, right? So it's not like you're affecting everybody, but you're affecting those ones who are on the margin. So then let's have a look at a couple of nudges. Um, so one of them is, uh, is sending reminders and in reminding, so this again comes to the information question. So giving a reminder at the right point of time. So maybe giving the exact same information that people already had, but at the point of time when they're about to make a decision. So I maybe know what the CO2 um, um, consumption of uh, or uh, used for making one kilo of meat is, but if Max restaurant shows it to me at the time I'm ordering a burger, it's a little bit different situation. Although I might have already known this previously, but if I get the information right before I make the decision, it will affect my behavior, which I could have forgotten. Not actually forgotten, but just not really thought about when making that decision when I, oh, this burger looks really delicious and then I want to meet one. Um, and then having the reminder at the right point of time maybe triggers my behavior. And it's again, just enough, obviously, not for the people who love the double, triple bacon burger. For them, it's not going to make the difference, right? But for those people who are like, oh, the vegetarian ones look good too. Um, oh yeah, maybe I should choose those. Um, so here, this is a study done by some colleagues of mine in the US quite recently. So it um, just came out as a working paper. So they're working with Virgin Atlantic Airways. And 
also here in, in Sweden we say that the two biggest um, climate problems are meat consumption and air travel. Right? So, and then often I get asked, so what can we do to make less people take, the, take an airplane? And well, there's probably some things we could do. I'm not really not sure that nudging is the thing that is going to work here because people have very strong preferences about modes of transport. I cannot nudge somebody not to go on summer vacation. I mean, I could educate them. I can have fees. Like, there's a lot of other things I can try to do. But nudge somebody not to, to go, I don't know, to Costa Rica on summer vacation, that's going to be really difficult. So, um, so they said, well, maybe we can try something else. And here, apparently, it is the fact that a lot of pilots, although they're very well educated and have been flying for years, are not flying as fuel efficient as they should be flying or as they could be flying. So there seems to be some potential to increase the efficiency of how pilots fly planes rather than trying to get more or less people to fly. Um, so that's something that they were interested in and wanted to work with. So they did the study on 40,000 flights. They have 314 pilots, and those are all the pilots who work for, uh, for Virgin Atlantic's Airways on long distance flights. In this study, they ran over the course of eight months. And what they did is that they sent these pilots reminders every month about how to fly more fuel efficient. I'm going to show you this on the, on the next uh, slide, how, what this looked like. And then they had different um, biases or different motivations that they wanted to use. It was, on the one hand, uh, personalized targets or personal information targets, and then some kind of uh, monetary incentive. In this case, it was a monetary incentive. It was not a nudging project as such, but part of it is nudging. So what they did here is that they sent the pilots these type of reports, and then it says your fuel and carbon efficiency report for that person, and then they give you this monthly fuel and carbon efficiency for a certain month. So they send them out every month. And then they have these three categories, which is called zero, zero fuel weight, efficient flight, and reduced engine and taxi. So yeah, I didn't really know what this was before, but uh, so zero fuel weight means that um, the airplane gets fueled up to about 90%, then everybody gets on board, all the luggage gets on board, and then they refuel once they know how heavy the plane is. So they, they have a scale so that they don't take more fuel than they actually need. Because fuel is heavy, and if you fly fuel from one place to the other while not using it, then you're, use, you're using a lot of fuel just to transport other fuel. So they should make this calculation before starting. But that is something that they actually need to kind of do by hand, and it takes some time to do properly. Then they have this efficient flight. Um, that is actually how, how you fly. So if there's a little bit more air you're pushing than going back. So kind of just adjusting the flight a bit. Um, so there's some reduction possibilities. And then the easiest one is when you're on the ground taxiing, you can turn off one of the engines, and the plane's still going to go straight. You just need one engine to go forward. But they often don't do this, so they keep both engines on, which also reduces fuel. And coming again to the information, this is not new information to people who have been working as pilots for 15 years. Like these three things, they knew this from the first day they started the training, and they all know this. So there was none of this was in any way knew that they, oh, wow, we can turn off one of the buttons. That's great. So yeah, so they knew this, it was not new. So sending these reminders should actually not have had any effect because they're not giving them new information. They're just reminding them that this is something they should be doing in the basic condition. Now this one is the target, so this actually gives them personalized targets saying, so last month you were flying, I don't know, you reached 70% of your fuel efficiency and I don't know, you should try to reach 90%. So there they got some extra information in the sense that they got some feedback on how they were flying, but the fact that, they, that this would be good to fly more fuel efficiency, f efficient, that did not um, matter and then it said something about you reached this many of your targets, well done and great. And then they had another condition where they actually said, because they couldn't give extra money to pilots, that wasn't really allowed. So they said, if you reach these goals, then um, money will go to charity. So then every time you reach one of these goals, money was donated to a charity of their choice. Um, so there you have kind of this uh, monetary incentive. And then what we see, we see here on the screen is the results of the study. In the light gray bars, we have the before condition. So that's... Um, this is now for taxi, so how often they turned off the second engine, uh, around 35%. Uh, in the before conditions, since it was randomized, it was kind of the same for all the pilots in the different conditions. And then during, you see that uh, there's almost 60%, so it almost doubles the amount of pilots who turn off that second button while going uh, well on the ground. Um, 
there's not so much different actually between these conditions. So whether you gave some extra money to charity didn't matter very much. But you see that, but also here you see that in the control condition it goes up a bit, which means all pilots had to be told that the study was happening, so they all knew their behavior was being monitored. So that actually drove a lot of the effect, actually knowing they were being monitored, which is not that great, but you still see that there's still a significant effect from the from this gray bar to this gray bar. So by adding this information, sending them these reminders, we still see an increase of them being even more, um, flying even more fuel efficient. So we see it for taxi and we see it for efficient flights. Um, so here people were flying more efficient. But then if we look at this fuel load, we see that there's almost nothing happening, right? So this again goes to the same idea was this marginal difference, right? So this nudge, this reminder, was enough to make them press a button when they were back on ground, but this fuel weight calculation, which takes quite some time, if you're already delayed, right, if the flight's already 10, 15 minutes delayed, this is going to take about 15 minutes to calculate, the pilot might be, ah, whatever, we need to leave now, so we'll just take a bit more fuel. So here, apparently, the costs of changing behavior were larger than what could be co combated by this nudge. I mean, in total, it's still a quite amazing savings. So the whole study cost $400, plus obviously the salary of the researchers, but that's taxpayer money, so that was paid for. So they paid $400 to send for the envelopes and the stamps, and then they fa uh, saved about $5 million in fuel. So that's 0.56% uh, uh, of their overall fuel cost over eight months on all their long distance flights, uh, all the flights that they were flying Virgin Atlantics. Um, leading to a reduction of 21.5 million kilograms of CO2 through these emails, or these, no, but they were actually uh, real letters, but through these letters being sent to the captains with information that they already previously had, right? So there's no new, new information here. So now I was, uh, so my, my colleague said that every single airline in the US has been calling them and they want to do this study too. Um, so obviously if you have lower, I mean, we also see that if that's 0.5% of the total fuel cost, it's a lot of fuel, right? But still, saving $5 million, you have to think about a lot of other interventions you can do for an airline to save uh, $5 million on a $400 budget. One, another one of these nudges is uh, social norms. So what, that was a bias, but then also using social norms to affect behavior. Um, this was a study also done by the Behavioral Insights team in the UK, and this was about people paying their taxes on time. So here you have a situation that people are supposed to pay their taxes by May, many of them do, and then you have these people who for either forgot or didn't want to or for some other reason have not paid their taxes by the end of the, of the tax year when they were supposed to. So this is quite expensive, uh, obviously, because you need to send them letters, you need to run after them, you need to call them, you need to, it's foregone tax revenue that you don't have interest on. So yeah, so the government was interested in increasing the amount of people who pay their taxes. And then they said, well, let's try an easy thing. You're going to send them a letter anyway. We sent one group randomly, a quarter of them, just the regular letter you always sent them. And for some of the others, we add this one sentence which says, nine out of 10 in, your, in the UK pay their taxes on time, and you're not one of them. So um, <laughs> saying that, uh, yeah, so other people do this, and obviously this is a correct number, right? Because by May, they knew that nine out of 10 people had paid their taxes, so they didn't make this up, but that's how many had paid, and just these people hadn't. Um, then you do the same thing for postal code, which is in this case like a larger area than the city. And then they did it for city, saying you in, in Newcastle, nine of ten people have paid this. So, and then as we see is that the closer this, this group is in this comparison is, the more people change their behavior. So the more people, 89% um, of them compared to the 67 and the baseline, so about a 20% increase, then also pay their taxes. And all they did was add this one sentence to the letter they were sending out anyway, right? But again, also the important thing here is here that they randomly sent different letters to the, to the people so they could actually see that there was an increase. If they would have just said, okay, let's just, we think city is gonna work best, so we're just gonna send all 100% of them the city letter, Maybe they would have gotten more tax revenue the year before, but maybe it was also because there was a new story and, I don't know, something else happened, why people decided to pay their taxes more that year than the year before. So by having this randomization between the different letters, they could actually say, compared to the control group, this is how many more people actually uh, paid their taxes on time using this nudge. And then as a, the last one here was a default alternative. 
So I'm not just going to do this briefly because I talked about it with the enrollment in the beginning. Um, so this was a study done by uh, colleagues of mine at uh, Swedish University. I think they did this uh, in Lund, actually. So they thought about, okay, having this, this is again a very easy default, right? Uh, duplex printing versus simplex printing. How many of you have default duplex printing at their work? Raise your hand. Okay, how many have default simplex? Uh, okay, one, yes, don't know. Okay, so usually it seems that there's still a lot of offices or maybe, I don't know, 20% or something, you still have the simplex printing set as a default. Obviously, if we would just set it to duplex, then we should have a 50% reduction, except if we only print uh, even pages, obviously, but um, that's not how far it went, so it was a 15% increase. But that just means that everybody who was just not thinking about it or didn't care enough, so I'm running some experiments with my students now, I care a lot that it's not two-sided because they need to get them, it's like a test, so they need to get individual pages, I cannot have it, so I'll switch it to simplex printing. But if I just need to read a paper, obviously I don't care. I prefer if it's on both sides because it's less to carry around. All right? So those, again, it's 15% who apparently don't care enough to switch um, when they print. Um, and then there's still these 35, I mean, these other percent who they care so much that do, they do switch back to simplex printing if they want to print out. So how do we know that it's not just going to work if we didn't do an experiment before, if we actually haven't tried this out? So here, this was something else that Behavioral Insights team did. I said, well, they wanted to increase the number of people who sign up to be organ donors. Um, and then they changed the message. And then they asked some experts previously and said, okay, so which message do you think is going to work best? So this is a, just a control. It's a, if you, I think if you sign up to renew your car registration, then you get this. Um, so there's just like, please sign up as an organ donor, basic message. Then they had one with the social norm, which is every day thousands of people who see this page decide to register, which was true because there were a lot of people si signing up when they saw this. Um, then they had the social norm where they had the logo uh, of the organ donor um, registry, and then they had a picture of a lot of people too. So when they asked the experts before running this experiment, which do you think is going to work best, they said, well, the one was the picture, because there's people on it, and it makes you feel about like organ donation, that's good, it's going to help other people. So they clearly said that they think that the social norm and picture is going to perform best. Then they did this experiment, they had the website, and then depending on when you entered the website, you saw different messages and different pictures. Uh, and what they find is that actually it did a tiny bit worse in the control, the one with the picture. And actually what worked better was just giving a social norm or having the logo. Why this was exactly the case, I mean, there's a paper there, there might be different reasons for it, but if you would have just asked an expert previously and then just done this, well, it would have led to actually less people signing up for organ donations. But it was quite easy to test, right? It's a website. I mean, you do A-B testing. IT people do that all the time. You just, whenever you enter the website, you see a different picture. And then you count how many people actually then sign up as organ donors, depending on these messages. And that, I think, is something that it would, is important to test, right? Because especially in situations where it's so easy to do, where you're not going to hurt a lot of people by either putting a picture or a logo there, um, there is something where I think there's a lot of situations where we can increase efficiency of things that we're already doing by testing out how can we improve it by a little bit. Um, and also to avoid this, maybe just do this for, I don't know, a smaller group of people. Just do it one morning and then see if you can already see a significant difference in behavior. So, um, yeah, uh, one of my colleagues here said this on this presentation, he said, well, there's this quote by Mark Twain saying, all you need is ignorance and confidence and then success is sure. So with a lot of things, right, I could be standing here and telling you, I have a PhD in behavioral economics, I've been doing this for five years, I know what's right. If you do the nudge like this, this is going to be the perfect outcome. And I mean, there's uh, people in the room, right, who also <laughs> make money in, uh, in doing this and helping others, but I think they're also not going to claim that they're just going to, like, you're going to sit down for half an hour and they're going to tell you what's best and then you're going to do this and it's going to turn out great. So also there, it's so important that there's experiments happening, they were testing out different theories. I mean, obviously, I do hope that I can say after five years of working with this, this is probably more likely to work than something else. And I assume for these and these and these reasons, because I've looked at how people have behaved in the situation, that this might be a good way to do it. But whether it's going to work, there's always things that might w turn out differently or something. And if it's completely obvious, then it's maybe not so, then you were doing it already, right? So for these finer things, there's really the question, how can we figure those out? Because the completely obvious things we don't need to, you don't need any experts to help you on, on that. 
Um, so it's, and I think an important thing to think about is also it's not about just changing behavior today, but actually thinking about learning something for the long term so that we actually know do these messages work. I mean, this work that the Behavioral Insights team has done now in the UK showing with some things apparently when r isolating r your roof, one of the problems was that you didn't want to clean up your attic. So that seemed to be something that was keeping people from, from doing something they should be. So adding to this knowledge, and we only know that because they ran a test where they said, okay, you can get a coupon for cleaning up your attic or you, we could just gonna make it cheaper to isolate the roof. Um, and then looking at that difference. So yes, in the very first round, obviously those people who got the cheaper isolation, they weren't isolating, right? But, but they tested this, they showed that the coupon for the roof cleaning made sense, and then two months later they sent out to everybody and then they had the effect. But obviously in that very first try, they had to only send it to one third of the people, so one third nothing happened, one third they got this um, just a subsidy, and then one third got the coupon, and for them, they saw the effect, and then you could roll it out to everybody else. So I think it's quite important. So I know that working with practitioners, this is always a, a risk. It's like, okay, if we only do it to 50%, but then we're going to miss out on those other 50%. Yes, but then at least we know whether what we're trying to do makes any sense. And then if we do it, because I mean, all of you here, the work you do, it's a long-term work, right? It's not, so I work a lot with charities as well. And I mean, they're like, yeah, but we need to get money now before Christmas and everything. But yeah, but I work with the Smithsonian Institution. Most of their, the average donor age is, I think, 79. So some of the people have been giving for 50 years. So it might make sense to find out why they have been giving for, for 50 years to this charity and how that varies. Um, and not just think about how can we get, maximize the money we get before Christmas. So if we think about something like medicine, I mean, there's also a lot of um, tests going on there, right? Nobody's going to take a pill just because some scientists thought that might be a good idea, right? There we also assume that somebody tests this on some people who get a placebo and on some people who get the actual pill, and then we see whether it makes a difference. And not just because some theory says that maybe cortisol or something would be good for this, but we actually test it first. Um, so that's the important third step. And if you think about, okay, so what is so new about nudging, if we think, well, a lot of it comes from marketing and maybe it's not so different, but a lot of what's new is that there's actually this controlled step-by-step -step testing and evaluation of these things like nudges and behavioral economics. So it's not just a random implementation of, uh, of theory from psychology, but that we're actually doing controlled tests um, of what works. So often when people do evaluations, I mean, most people do because they have to, because they need to report what they did the past year and how that changed. Then often what happens is that you have a baseline and then you do something and then you look at the difference. So when I was talking to, to Kostad Municipality, they said, well, they bought these new environmental friendly cars and they wanted to see whether that decreased fuel use, traditional fuel use. You could still fuel the cars with the traditional fuel, but also with gas. Um, and then what they did is that they said, well, then we look at last year, October, and then we bought the cars in May, and then we look at this year, October, and then we look at the difference, and then that's the effect of the cars. Now, as we can imagine, right, there's lots of things that might have happened between last year, October, and this year, October, that changed how much people were driving these cars, which had nothing to do whether this car was environmental, environmental friendly or not. So the effect of probably changing these cars are so small that any type of, I don't know, one of the departments was relocated somewhere else so they needed less cars would completely cover up any effect of the difference in the cars. So then what I think I'm measuring is this effect of the nudge, and that might not be true. It could be the other way as well, right? I find nothing and say, okay, that was a waste of time. We didn't find anything. But maybe it's just something else happened simultaneously that affected uh, this. So actually my nudge was hugely successful, maybe a 10% increase in something, but something else cost, I don't know, there was a change in price on non-organic meat uh, or something, and so more people bought that, although actually my nudge would have increased uh, uh, the purchasing by 10%. But then it looks like a minus 5% difference just because something else happened at the same time. So when we, um, when we do these studies, it's always very important to, uh, to have a control group which, for whom nothing changes. So as we had before with the letters, right, they were still sending out the regular tax letters to one quarter of the people because they wanted to see what is the effect, how many people will pay their taxes after receiving this letter, the one that we always send out this year, not last year, but this year. 
because there might be lots of other things going on. If we have this randomization, some of them, so we have the group itself, we randomly divide them up into two of the groups. Uh, so we have the, as many blue and green people in each group as, um, yeah, as a representative uh, sample of the, um, our target group. Then some of them get the letter of tail telling them that nine of 10 people do this. The others just get the regular tax letter and then we can look at the difference between the two outcomes to see, okay, for whom did this actually have an effect? How many more people have we gotten to, to uh, pay their taxes um, compared, to, uh, compared to the control letter? Because then we know that the only thing that is different between these two groups is actually this one sentence on the letter and not that one maybe didn't even get a letter or um, something else happening. So what do we do? We, um, so I'm working together, well, somebody's here from Notre Dame as well. So they gave us a grant to work together with municipalities, organizations, institutions, Manikita in Sweden um, to try out more of these nudges, behavioral economic incentives, trying to affect behavior similar to what the behavioral insights team has been uh, doing in the UK. There is some focus on sustainability, but I mean, sustainability is quite a broad topic. So <laughs> there's a lot of things that, that fall under that. Um, so what are they doing? They're kind of paying my salary mostly, a little bit salary of some of my colleagues, but mostly mine, um, that I work with organizations on, on trying out these things. So if anybody is interested on testing these things, really doing, uh, doing a study, then in a sense, I work for free, not for free, but I am paid for because the idea is that we really increase the knowledge we have about how these things work in Sweden and how they work for, for different institutions. How do they work long term? How do they work in a negative sense? These kind of, uh, these kind of things. And obviously our restrictions are that it needs to be a randomized controlled trial. So what I was just saying before, right? It cannot be just doing a nudge and seeing what happens. So it, we need quite a lot of observations. So there are some, it needs to be sensible for research, so there are some restrictions of what we're interested in so that it makes sense for me to spend, uh, spend my time on it. But I think there is quite a lot of overlap between what could be interesting for organizations and what is interesting for, for researchers as well. So in that sense, we're quite, um, yeah, we're still looking for collaboration partners. Um, so if that could be interesting to you, then let me know. If you're more interested in just getting another eight hour workshop of this, <laughs> then I'm also doing workshops, one actually in two weeks and uh, one in January.